On the 1st of September 1939, the same day Germany invaded Poland, RMS Queen Mary made her last pre-war run from Southampton to New York. By the time she reached Manhattan, Great Britain and France were at war with Germany. British authorities ordered her to stay put. Queen Mary's rival, France's magnificent liner Normandy, already sat idly at the next pier. RMS Mauritania was also berthed nearby. But what was next? In this episode of Battle Stars, we celebrate Queen Mary, the lone survivor of the romantic and bygone era of the great transatlantic liners. Not only was she the pride of the British liner fleet and winner of the Blue Ribbon, but during World War II, she also proved to be the Allies' most effective troop carrier and one-ship convoy. Queen Mary had a difficult berth. Cunard Line laid down the future ocean liner in Scotland in 1930, but after a year of steady progress, the Great Depression brought construction to a halt. In exchange for the funding needed to finish its greatest project, Cunard agreed to the government's demand that it absorb the failed White Star Line. RMS Queen Mary was finally launched in 1934. Ten million rivets later, in early 1936, she was completed. And by August of that year, on her sixth round trip to New York, she set new speed records in both directions to take the Blue Ribbon from Normandy. Fast forward to early 1940 in Manhattan. Queen Mary and Normandy had spent the winter in limbo, but everything changed quickly starting in February. First, tragically, a fire destroyed Normandy. Next, in March, to the surprise of almost everyone, the brand new and untested RMS Queen Elizabeth appeared in New York. Built to be Queen Mary's running mate, she arrived not only unannounced, but also painted entirely in navy gray. Queen Mary was likewise requisitioned by the British government and her familiar black, white, and red livery repainted, and the gray ghost was born. Queen Mary sailed to Australia, where she and several other liners were converted into troop transports. All stateroom furniture, the ship's lavish decorations, and six miles of carpet were removed. In the end, 220 cases of dinnerware, crystal, silver, tapestries, and paintings were removed and warehoused for the duration on three different continents. A six-inch gun, triple-tiered fixed wooden bunks, and other military gear, such as a degaussing coil, were added. Leather coverings were installed to protect the woodwork. Grand Admiral Raider said Hitler failed to grasp the hard facts about British sea power. Apart from the great imbalance between the size of the Royal Navy and the Kriegsmarine, no better example of Britain's maritime advantage was the ability to summon and refit a multinational fleet of privately owned luxury ocean liners into a monster fleet of large high-speed troop ships that could outrun submarines and surface ships, and to do the refitting safely outside the war zone. Besides Queen Mary, the Queen Elizabeth, Aquitania, Mauritania, Ile-de-France, New Amsterdam, and others were similarly refitted. In May 1940, the greatest convoy ever mustered to carry troops left Sydney under naval escort. The convoy comprised Queen Mary, Aquitania, Mauritania, and three other converted liners, with 25,000 Australian and New Zealand troops embarked, bound for Scotland via South Africa. Lest we assume the Anzacs had a luxury cruise, Riots erupted because of the great heat. Men went AWOL in South Africa. Several died at sea. Built for the North Atlantic passenger trade, few spaces on board Queen Mary had air conditioning, and the ship was a sweltering nightmare. While the Anzacs cursed Queen Mary, the world's most famous liner already had Hitler's personal attention. He offered the fantastic sum of $250,000 to the U boat skipper who sent her to the bottom but the only time a U-boat ever put a torpedo into the liner happened in a movie starring Frank Sinatra, in Assault on a Queen, released in 1966 when Queen Mary's career was winding down. Frank plays a former U.S. submarine officer who joins an eccentric band of wannabe pirates who raise and rehabilitate a sunken U-boat for the purpose of robbing the Queen Mary. After persuading the liner to stop, their group's nominal leader, who is a former U-boat officer, fires a dummy torpedo into the ship to intimidate her captain. Their plan comes a cropper, 
and the boat is rammed and sunk by a Coast Guard cutter. But Frank, his love interest, and Frank's wingman land in a rubber raft. As the gracious queen sails away, with her horn blowing and making smoke, the trio start paddling for South America. Queen Mary proved impossible to hit in real life. Unlike in the movie, when her captain was duped into stopping, during the war the ship's officers had orders not to stop for anything. The liner's high speed was not only legendary, but also her greatest protection. As a result, the Queen's four minor encounters with U-boats are quickly summarized. First, in June 1940, guided by secret intelligence, a wolf pack of five boats centered on U-48 assembled off Cape Finisterre to intercept Queen Mary and other liners on their return from Australia. At risk were the 25,000 embarked Anzac troops mentioned earlier. Likely alerted to the danger by prior sinkings in the area and their own intelligence, Queen Mary veered out to sea, steering around danger. Next, on the 1st of October in 1942, the young skipper of U-407, a Type 7C on its first patrol, claimed he fired a spread of four torpedoes at the liner as she approached the Irish coast. Not surprisingly, her great speed while zigzagging was misjudged by the inexperienced commander. Whether Queen Mary was even aware of the attack is not clear. Possibly the most serious threat came in April 1944. Another Type 7, U-385, operating from Norway, fired a three-torpedo salvo at what the boat's captain described as an Empress-class liner but was in fact Queen Mary. He went so far as to claim two hits and two boiler explosions. For her part, Queen Mary reported a heavy underwater explosion, suggesting a torpedo had detonated prematurely. Finally, another U-boat on its first patrol, U-853, had weather-watching duty during May and June 1944. The boat was trying to help German intelligence predict the timing of an Allied invasion of Europe. On May 25th, U-853 spotted a massive fast-moving liner. The ship was Queen Mary. As usual, she was loaded with American troops, supplies, and equipment. The U-boat submerged, but before it could get into attack position, Queen Mary raced past, disappearing as quickly as she had appeared. Though Queen Mary had carried American troops to Australia in early 1942, by October of that year, she was operating full-time in the North Atlantic to shuttle GIs to Great Britain. She sailed with as many as 15,000 troops. Typically, U.S. destroyers escorted the liner from the American coast into the open ocean. Then, leaving their American escorts behind, she zigzagged alone at high speed across the Atlantic. As she neared the British Isles, the Royal Navy escorted her to the Firth of Clyde in Scotland. Two oddities occurred that are worth noting. On October 2, 1942, the day after U-407 had made its unsuccessful attack on Queen Mary, the 81,000-ton liner had its worst day in a long career when it struck and sliced in half the old light cruiser HMS Curacoa, displacing a little more than 4,000 tons. With some 15,000 Americans on board, including the entire 29th Infantry Division, the Queen plowed onward, now with a fractured stem. Fast-thinking chaps heaved life jackets overboard, but the cruiser quickly foundered, taking some 240 sailors with them. Destroyers rescued about 100 men. The controversy that followed, in part about the rescue effort but mostly about apportioning blame, lasted well into the post-war period and ended with the Royal Navy and the liner sharing responsibility. Queen Mary was apportioned one-third of the blame. Two months after the collision, when during a gale, she was suddenly struck broadside by a rogue wave more than 90 feet high. Think the Poseidon Adventure, if you remember the film from 1972, parts of which were filmed on board Queen Mary. Down, over, and forward she pitched. Portholes were smashed open, with many passengers injured. Witnesses weren't wrong when they swore the giant liner nearly capsized. Officially, Queen Mary rolled a sickening 52 degrees, three more degrees, and she would have been lost. Less eventful was a crossing during July 1943, when Queen Mary set a record by carrying nearly 17,000 soldiers and crew, many of whom had to sleep on deck. 
but what about steaming in the opposite direction? There were no known encounters between Queen Mary and U-boats during 1941 or 1943. Given how safe travel on board the liner had shown itself to be, she often carried a variety of VIPs and special passengers, such as Dam Buster Guy Gibson, important intelligence officers and German POWs, as well as wounded troops home to North America. Queen Mary's most notable traveler was Colonel Warden. That was the name used by Prime Minister Winston Churchill on the ship's passenger manifest. Churchill made three voyages to North America and one return trip in Queen Mary during the war. In May 1943 for the Trident Conference, Churchill and his senior advisors secretly departed in Queen Mary to confer with FDR and his service chiefs. At the time, Queen Mary had on board 5,000 German POWs, including U-boat crew, who were confined to a lower deck under guard. For the second Quebec conference, in August 1943, Churchill again traveled in Queen Mary, but more slowly, as she was escorted by U.S. carrier Ranger and British carrier Illustrious, as well as three heavy cruisers, destroyers, and land-based aircraft. He made a final wartime trip in 1944. Queen Mary made 72 wartime voyages between 1940 and 1946, during which she transported 800,000 troops. In the early trips, she carried fewer than 10,000 people. By 1942, she typically carried more than 10,000 and often 15,000 soldiers. Her last voyage carrying troops to Scotland took place in March 1945. After the war ended, she participated in Operation Magic Carpet, the effort to bring them all home again. Churchill himself said it best when he said the Queen Mary shortened the war by a year. Thanks for watching. Consider subscribing if you enjoyed this video.